welcome everybody to the podcast Beyond Perception, where it's really about breaking out of your own mind prison. And uh, here we are exposing you to information you might not be currently aware of. And in, in, with the purpose, with the sole purpose to show you who you are, what's your true potential, what reality is, to make sense out of reality, because that's really the key to empower, empowerment, personal empowerment. And it's a true pleasure to have Ed here with me uh, today. He is a conspiracy researcher for a couple of years now. And uh, as most of you might know or might have heard, the term conspiracy itself, it's controversial. Some people run away when you mention it. Some people are very much attracted to it. And, and, it's, uh, and it's really a very interesting topic. And so welcome, Ed. It's a true pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for having me on, Simon. And uh, I'm really curious and uh, interested to, to uh, hear a bit of yeah. what conspiracies is and something I just read yesterday. It uh, is an article uh, in the New York Times where they write about conspiracy and uh, the psychology behind. And in this article, they kind of um, condense a couple of the very extreme conspiracy the theories such as air cannibals, there's satanic pedophiles, uh, lizard people running the world, and um, also that uh, basically one third of Americans believe that uh, the Chinese government uh, engineered the coronavirus to, uh, as a weapon. And um, so th there, there's really there's kind, of, kind of a lot of people interested or believing in conspiracy theories. Oh, uh, yes. Is this an article that tries to say, like, conspiracy theorists have some sort of psychological issue or we need to make sense of a chaotic world? Yes, yes, it's been an argument for a long time. I'll just have to correct you. I've actually been researching conspiracy theories for nine years. OK. Um, yeah, basically, there was a study recently in New Zealand that actually proved that this was not the case. And what we need to remember is there have actually been at least, I can think of 42 admitted false flags across the world. A false flag is when a government attacks its own people as an excuse to start a war or to start a campaign of some sort. So for example, there was Operation Northwards, and this has all gone mainstream now. There was also the Gulf of Tonkin, the Gulf of Tonkin launched the entire Vietnam War. And there was an opinion piece in The Guardian saying that this was a work of fiction. So what we've got to remember is that these aren't actually far-fetched things. And a conspiracy in itself is not a far-fetched thing. There are laws written on people committing conspiracies. I mean, people commit conspiracies on a daily basis. So... <laughs> What we've got to actually really grasp here is that there is a, a smear campaign against conspiracy theorists and conspiracy believers. For a start, you've got to remember, there's a very wide spectrum of conspiracy believers. I mean, yeah, maybe at the like, highest end of the spectrum, you have people who believe in shape-shifting lizards. Then at the bottom end of the spectrum, you know, you have people who believe JFK was assassinated. And sometimes the media tries to pull all conspiracy believers together and say, oh, they all have psychological problems, which isn't true. I mean, going back to JFK, the University of Texas Press actually published a work, an academic work that proved that the CIA was using discrediting misinformation and disinformation campaigns against people who complained and criticize the Warren Commission report about JFK. And JFK, I mean, I could go on about it. But there are a lot of reasons to believe that <laughs> it was a conspiracy by the CIA. For example, a CIA agent actually admitted on his deathbed that he was part of a team that murdered JFK. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's it. Uh, quite fascinating because on the first, first of all, it is 
these are information or these are these are details most of the people are never exposed to but what in what in your words what what is a conspiracy or what is a conspiracy theory or where did this label or this word that came from like what what is the origin of it well the term conspiracy theory is it's been around for a few hundred years but as this university of texas press uh, academic work proves that the term was kind of hijacked by the cia i mean a conspiracy is just a people meeting up together to conspire a plan to achieve a desired outcome really uh, well to um come up with like kind of an evil plan or a devious plan i mean people planning on a bank heist that right there is a conspiracy among people so yeah the term itself it is really being abused by the mainstream media and what we've got to remember is that there are journalists like very prestigious journalists to this day who still criticize the mainstream media they say it's run by the cia such as udo ofcop and if you really analyze what's going on in the world you can you can see that the media is lying about things for example weapons of mass destruction. The media didn't do their job properly um, of whether question if Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. Israel being an apartheid, Stephen Hawking has boycotted Israel, but the mainstream media doesn't, you know, they, they try to cover it up. At first, they try to say Stephen Hawking boycotted Israel for another reason, and then Hawking released later that he boycotted because he supported the Palestinian cause. So there's, there really is a campaign to smear conspiracy theorists. And there are theories about smearing conspiracy theorists. There's one theory that the whole flat earth movement was actually cultivated just to smear conspiracy theorists because people they they turn off like for example if they hear you support an absurd theory such as the earth being flat you could tell them all this other true stuff like jfk being assassinated or lies to go into iraq and they immediately they're like oh but he believes in flat earth but anyway that is just a theory that smear campaign tactic yeah so um what i what i understand it's really different to under uh, difficult to understand what's the theory and what's actually fact but um some of the theories might be fact but considered a theory so it's really a, a bit of a tricky or, or confused situation so um how like what like, first of all i would also be very curious to hear how how, how did you get into this topic of researching conspiracies and how how also um do you fact check conspiracies or how, how do you discover what 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 could be true that, that, because that's also the, uh, the the underlying question of of this whole podcast here what's the truth and how can we find it so that would that would be super interesting okay okay well you're giving me a lot to work with so I guess we'll start off with how I got into it all. So how I got into it, originally when I was young, <laughs> this, this is true, I, I listened to a lot of Tupac Shakur rap music. And what Tupac says is that the war on drugs in the USA is about oppressing the black population in the USA. But that was always just called a conspiracy theory. Why? Because there was never really any solid proof. So I knew this. And then I came across a video that said that 9-11 was an inside job. And the more and the more I researched it, the more I became convinced that it was an inside job. So there were all these things that the media didn't report on, such as nanothermite residue being found in the um, site 
can, when can towers quickly, collapsed. Can you quickly explain what, what is it? Nanothermite, it's a sort of, it's kind of like an explosive. So if you ignite it, it burns at incredibly hot temperatures, hot enough to melt steel. And, and that's another thing there was, in fact, molten steel at the sites. Sorry, I, I don't really want to go off on a tangent here. Maybe we could come back to that. I'll, I'll just stick on this one for now. Yeah. Um, so, so basically, I saw all this, and suddenly something just clicked. It just clicked. I knew this teacher. I was very fond of him. He, he was very, like, well studied. He had gone to Cambridge University. And I just knew, I just knew that he was all into this conspiracy stuff. I went, I went and confronted him about what had happened. And he essentially told me that the Illuminati had survived. Mm -hmm. All right. He, he survived into the 20th century. And I know, I know a lot of people are going to be like, what? But when, when I show you the evidence, I do think um, I can persuade you. Can you anyway, for those who, who don't know the Illuminati? Um, maybe something <laughs> quickly. I, the Illuminati was a secret society that uh, united some of the best academics, um, raw, European royalty, like banking houses in the 18th century. It was originally to challenge the church at the time. But it kind of grew into this, like this cult of um, might is right and taking over like governments and societies. And basically, I don't think the Illuminati still exists, but I think it founded the oligarchy that rules today. And a lot of you are going to obviously be shaking your heads. It's like, come on, come on. But Winston Churchill, in fact, wrote an article on Zionism versus Bolshevism, where he admitted that the Illuminati had survived right into the 20th century. And also the Skull and Bone Society at Yale, a Hoover Institute research fellow, Anthony Sutton, actually proves that the Skull and Bone Society at Yale is a chapter of the original Illuminati. So once you know this, it doesn't sound so far-fetched. So the, the argument is, so I'm really trying to keep a structure here. <laughs> There's a lot of information. Okay, so like whether an oligarchy rules us today and what its plans for society is. President Jimmy Carter, he says that we are run by an oligarchy. Noam Chomsky, one of the most cited academics on the planet, he says we are run by an oligarchy. An oligarchy is when we are controlled by the most richest and powerful people on the planet. This would include the biggest tycoons, the leaders of the banking houses, even some members of Silicon Valley now, heads of state like royalty. And yeah, basically it's this, so the argument for the conspiracy theorist is, is, is this oligarchy? Because this is the only people who really have the power to put off these massive, conspiracies if you believe 9-11 was an inside job so we know we are controlled by an oligarchy if you do the research and we know all the heads of the mainstream media are meeting up with the heads of the banking houses and the biggest tycoons and like oil and minerals in the western world we know they're all meeting up and we've got a say they're the ones who benefit the most for example from the war with iraq they were the ones who were able to finance the war machine the banks and they'll make profits on it they were the ones who had the shares in the weapon contractors who profited they were the ones who gained all the oil in iraq apologies i kind of went off on another tangent i'll try and, <laughs> I'll, I'll try and get back on track so 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 um yeah so how i got into it going back to that so basically um after this cambridge university scholar told me that the illuminati were real 
I just believed him. I believed him. I believed him because I knew 9-11 was an inside job. And I believed him because I was convinced the war on drugs wasn't about oppressing black people. And interestingly enough, Richard Nixon's advisor um, actually admitted that the war on drugs was about oppressing black people. And there are currently, you know, thousands and thousands of black people who are in jail for just smoking marijuana, which I think is absolutely disgraceful in the USA. But again, I'm going off on another tangent, so I'll try and come back to the original mm -hmm. tangent. Mm -hmm. So, as soon as I got told this, I mean, I'm 29 today, I was around 20 years old. Immediately I believed it. I started telling as many people as I possibly could. And I just put pretty much everything else on my life on hold. I wasn't interested really in like chasing women or going out to the pub or whatever. I was just convinced, oh my God, I can't believe the world is in such a dire, disgraceful state. And like, and no one believed me, you know, I, I was just yeah, a 20 year old. I just wanted to ask you, what, what was the reaction? <laughs> How did it go? <laughs> I've got to be real. I mean, back then, I was not a very knowledgeable person. I actually remember when I started, I was like, it's corporations, it's the corporations. And of course, people would just laugh at me because there are, you know, there are thousands and thousands upon corporations. Like one guy was like, my dad owns a corporation. He's got nothing to do with 9-11. I mean, then once I started researching more, I became like stronger in my argument. You know, I could explain exactly which transnational corporations were behind it. But yeah, what I really should have done is researched it thoroughly first then started preaching i went straight into preaching and i'll tell you why i went straight into preaching so this man alan ramsden shortly after i uh started preaching one of the reasons i kept preaching and i didn't put it on pause even he developed terminal cancer and you know some people they, maybe they'll say it's a coincidence I mean, to this day, I don't know what happened. That it could be a conspiracy. At the time, I was convinced it was a conspiracy. I mean, I can't prove anything. I've looked into it. All I can prove is that there is technology that can give people cancer purposefully. And it goes back, I think, 60 odd years. The Russians were using it. But I mean, that's the only evidence I can get. He got terminal cancer and he told his son on his deathbed that the Illuminati were real. And because that happened, I, I felt an extreme sense of guilt and it got to the point I was studying at university. I mean, a lot of people, you know, they go out and party at university. I mean, I did get to do a tiny bit of that, but I, I just felt so guilty. I just wanted to stay in. I just wanted to preach, wake up as many people as possible and learn as much as possible because I felt that this man gave up his life. Um, but yeah, as I said, I can't prove that this is true, but I mean, all I can say is I believe it, but it will remain in the theory category. Because uh, yeah, so um, yeah, so moving on, that's kind of my origin story of why I became so obsessed with studying conspiracy topics. Um, yeah, so, so let's go on to um, how I rate um, conspiracies, how I try and separate theory from fact. So I've got my own scale. There's conspiracy theory. These are things that can't be proven or unproven. For example, shape shifting lizards, I'd say is a conspiracy theory. Then there's a conspiracy fact. Then there's conspiracy nonsense. Mm. So for example, conspiracy nonsense, I'm sorry if some flat earthers are watching, but I am going to have to categorize it as nonsense. I mean, at the end of the day, you can fly up in a, a MiG. There's a Russian company that let you do it and you can see the Earth curve. You can go to the Northern Hemisphere. You can go to the Southern Hemisphere. You can compare the constellations. Draco constellations only in the Northern Hemisphere, guys. I'm sorry. So flat Earth is conspiracy nonsense. Then there's conspiracy fact, and this is where it gets tricky. Conspiracy fact, I mean, sometimes maybe you'll get someone, for example, 
maybe you'll get some really like um, highly academically achieved, like Stephen Hawking, he'll come along and he'll say Israel is an apartheid. So we know there is a conspiracy to cover up that Israel is committing war crimes and is mistreating the Palestinians. And then you can look at all the evidence. But then again, some people still argue with Stephen Hawking, even though he's got a massive IQ. I don't know what it is exactly. I think the Simpsons said it was over 200. Oh, yeah. He made a guest appearance. Obviously, he's a really clever guy. But still, some people um, say, no, he's wrong. So, and even, and then for some people just say it's wrong because they want to carry on the uh, policies in the Middle East. So I guess to a degree, it really comes down to what the individual and the majority is willing to accept as fact. Uh, uh. <laughs> just playing devil's advocate here, just because Stephen Hawking is very intelligent, it does not necessarily mean like what he says is right. So, like, mm -hmm. is it that you, that you're kind of looking at the evidence, the the, the references, the stories, the like, uh, like? Yeah, well, there, there is plenty of evidence. Haaretz is one of the oldest Israeli newspapers. It will give evidence of how they're mistreating Palestinians, how they're force feeding them, how there are policies, for example, if Palestinians rock throw, they'll get jail terms. If Israelis rock throw, you know, they'll just get a slap on the wrist. But there are things much worse, like there's how they bomb Gaza, how they respond with um, warfare that's like, way out of the league that the Palestinians can achieve. Um, interestingly, I think this, I do think this goes uh, beyond just what people can believe, this particular example of Israel being an apartheid. But yeah, you, you just have to gather the evidence and you've got to look at it honestly and you've got to make a judgment call. And a lot of people find that hard to do because they have too much trust in our institutions and our mainstream media. I mean, people who don't realize that they're being brainwashed, you know, they'll trust what the Washington Post or whatever tells them. If there's a journalist writes a piece for the Washington Post saying Israel is not an apartheid, they'll take that as gospel truth. People need to be taught to not just read, but to question what they read. And it really is essential to develop humanity. And so you would recommend instead of trusting or going to whatever like intermediaries in terms of uh, news or information to, to go to the source of the information or to look at the studies or like, like what would be a, or like also what are resources you would recommend to look at or are there resources or is it that you need to be open to everything and question everything you are exposed to. I, I think question everything. Hey, question what I say, like, at the end of the day, if you want truth, I think you need to, you need to discover it by yourself. If I just tell someone something that is true, I mean, if they don't believe it, they won't accept it as truth. And even though technically it is true, I mean, it's true in the physical sense, but in the mind is still not true. So it, it's kind of only, it, it's only really true when enough people accept it. Well, it's interesting uh, philosophical discussion about um, people's truths, but, and again, I'll try not go off on a tangent. Um, but, so I would say, do your own research. I mean, I can recommend plenty of sources uh, for people who are interested in conspiracy topics. There's John Pilger. John Pilger is a BAFTA award-winning journalist. He will explain in detail, if you look at his work, how the mainstream media is controlled. There's Paul Craig Roberts. Paul Craig Roberts, he was in the Legion of Honor. No, he still is in the Legion of Honor, sorry. He was an editor of the Wall Street Journal. He worked under Ronald Reagan, and if you go on his website, he'll provide an abundance of material for evidence of conspiracy topics. But yeah, if what you've got to always think is the old Latin 
uh, motto, Quay Bono, who benefits? I mean, you've always got to be thinking of people's motivations, people's biases, preferences, what people want you to think. You, you always have to question every single person you see. But some people watching this they'll maybe question me like, okay, is a sales pitch coming? What's this guy's deal? I don't know, they, they think all sorts. Is this guy working for Russia? I mean, of course I'm not. Um, <laughs> I can show my bank account. I'm certainly not getting paid by them or anything. But yeah, I, I mean, I could go off on a whole tangent on that. This is an absolutely massive topic. I mean, ultimately, um, we've got to realise that the doomsday clock is 100 seconds to midnight and we do need to change our aggressive policies. But well, what's the doomsday clock? Uh, yeah. The doomsday clock, it was set up around the time that the first nuclear bomb was dropped by leading academics, like a load of Nobel Prize winners have maintained it over time to this day. And we are the closest to disaster ever. 100 seconds to midnight. Midnight means like nuclear war or like end of civilization. And, and uh, would, you, would you say this is a, a sensible measure of the state of whatever, our, our earth? Or if you believed in conspiracy theory, theories, you could also say that um, whatever, this is a mechanism or um, a tool to kind of push through further measures or policies, whatever. Um, no, I don't believe it is. Um, I mean, for a start, if you're going to come up with a conspiracy theory, you need some sort of evidence. You do need an argument. I mean, I can make a conspiracy theory up on the spot. I could say we're all run by fairies at the end of the garden. At the end of the day, you need some evidence. And to really decode if it's a conspiracy fact, what you need is evidence and you need solid logic to say, because this happened, that means that could have happened. So this must be the truth. I mean, if you want, I could give you an example. Uh, so let's look at one piece of evidence um, that suggests that 9-11 was an inside job. Okay, there was nanothermite found in the rubble at the site of the towers, but I think he's called Niles Harrett. Um, like he's, he's a qualified professor scientist. So like, how would this nanothermite might get there? Would anyone working at the trade center have nanothermite? Large quantities of nanothermite. And it seems very unlikely. So immediately you could say, okay, this kind of makes me like 90% sure that 9-11 was an inside job. You kind of got to scale it. And a lot of it does come down to your own reasoning. But if you Get really it. want the truth, you, you just got to be brutally honest. You really, you really got to want truth to receive it. So, so if, here, here um, like my argument or whatever, like the, the other's argument, not believing in this conspiracy is something along the lines, um, for example, what, what I've been heard, I, ha I heard before is uh, Occam's razors, uh, razor principle that uh, the simplest explanation is usually the right one. And also that, that uh, newspapers or journalism is the fourth power in the state. That's something I grew up with and it's kind of controlling uh, the government. So how should possibly, if that's like, I mean, the 9-11, I remember that sitting in front of the screen and it was a very traumatic and kind of changing experience and and then um someone telling you this is made up or this is an inside shop or this is this is not true what is communicated to you this is so difficult to grasp and the first question mm -hmm. coming is like if if this is set up how like how does how how could this be possibly done without anyone recognizing yeah and 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 um Oh, oh, people have recognized it, for example. I mean, you've got to remember the mainstream media, it gives you a side of the story, but it misses out facts and it misses out testimonies. Silence is as bad as lying. So, for example, the, uh, well, 
oh, sorry, the ex-head of all US military intelligence, Albert Stubblebine, he says on record that like the plane did not hit the Pentagon or that 9-11 just doesn't add up. And then, like, uh, Dario Fo, a Nobel Prize winner, he uh, was part of a documentary where he provides evidence and testimonies that 9-11 was an inside job. But, you know, you read a review, like, about his uh, documentary, it's called Zero and Investigation. You read a review about it in the Guardian newspaper. And the Guardian newspaper, you know, it doesn't say, like, a good argument against what he's provided is just a smear tactic. He's just like, oh, two out of five stars, like he ranted on, just some nonsense. So there are people out there who are saying it is an inside job. There was William Rodriguez. William Rodriguez, in fact, um, he was a massive hero, 9-11. He was a janitor and due to his quick thinking and due to his courage, he saved I think like hundreds of lives uh, by letting out loads of people. And the media immediately jumped all over him and like, William Rodriguez, we love you. But they all turned off him quickly and they turned off him because he said he heard explosions in the basement of the tower before planes hit. That was his testimony. And immediately he became a pariah, a leper. They, uh, yeah, it, I mean, the, oh, sorry, go on, go on. No, no, no. Uh, I'm just like, the argument then would be, okay, like, who would be so insane to, 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 to create this event, um, kill thousands of, uh, thousands of people, would, like, what would be the benefit of it? Uh, why would you create something like that? And like, what, what's, the, what's the bigger picture of this? Okay, so going back, it'd be the oligarchy I was referring to earlier. The oligarchy, or essentially the Bilderberg group. So these oligarchs, these big tycoons, heads of media, the big, big, big fat cats, the biggest fat cats on the planet of the Western world. Okay, so you, these guys, they meet up at Bilderberg group, they meet up at this club called the Bohemian Grove Club. Um, there's also like these think tanks Rockefeller found did that a lot of them attend, like the Trilateral Commission, the Council on Foreign Relations. What you've got to conclude is that if 9-11 was an inside job, which I am convinced it is, is that it was this oligarchy, it was this power elite who were behind it. And they did it because they want to start a a war and a campaign in the Middle East where they boost the economy and they boost their profits and shares by loaning money to the government. I mean, it costs trillions of dollars. I mean, all this money is like lent from the bankers. I mean, it's all got to get paid back. The profit is astronomical. They'd be making trillions off that alone. And then of course they get all the oil, but ultimately, the plan of this oligarchy is full spectrum dominance. So at the moment, we've got this oligarchy. It kind of overrules like Western Europe, North America and Oceania and, and some other countries as, as well, like such as countries in the Caribbean. I mean, they really pull the strings and then they, they want full spectrum dominance of the world chessboard. Then we've got China for their own superpower. We've got Russia. We've got an alliance between Russia and China. Then Russia and China, they are on the side of Iran. Iran obviously has massive oil reserves, which is very handy. And then also this network, and the Western network, the Bilderberg network, it also goes into Israel. It, sees over Israel. They, I mean, if you do the research, you can find out that Israel is run by an oligarchy. It goes into Saudi Arabia, it has big connections into Saudi Arabia. It's opening up relations with the United Arab Emirates. So you've really got to view the world as like competitive. You've got everyone is in a turf war. We're in a big, big turf war. And the aim of the game, You've got to get the resources 
you've got to get the power, you've got to get the foothold. And their aim, it seems they want a world war. It's the only way to win the ultimate chess game. And it sounds completely mad. So this is why they started this campaign. It was to actually clear up the old uh, kind of Soviet dominated countries. So how do we know that this is the plan? Four star general, General Wesley Clark, right after 9-11, he exposed that we'd go into seven countries in seven years such as Yemen, Somalia, Iraq, Iran. Uh, apologies, I think it was Afghanistan. Did I say Yemen? I think Yemen as well. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I forgot that wrong, people. Oh. I'm, no, I'm nine, I'm nine, I'm central, that's it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, check that. Anyway, um, so... And we hadn't attacked any of these countries at the time, just after 9-11, back in 2001. Then we ended up attacking these countries. So these, oh, Lebanon, sorry, sorry, Lebanon, Lebanon. That was the one I was thinking of. But yeah, you look over time and General Wesley Clark's prophecy has been fulfilled exactly. We've deployed in all of those regions and we've, we're trying to destabilize Syria and Iran and the doomsday clock is 100 seconds to midnight. Stephen Hawking warned that the war in Syria must end or we threaten much life on earth. So the ultimate goal is they're gonna attack Iran and I believe Iran's gonna trigger a world war. Russia and China kind of need Iran. It's got the biggest oil reserves and if Iran is lost, it's kind of like the chessboard is lost. Maybe not completely, but in the long term, it will be. But because of this competitive nature, I mean, China has its own plans. China wants to dominate. You got to think all these big superpowers, they plan like a hundred odd years in advance. And you got to, it's, they see the world as a chessboard. We're not, we're not democratic. We're not fighting for freedom. We're fighting for, power and resources because we want to stay number one I, I think i briefly mentioned it the wolfowitz doctrine actually proved this this was made by paul wolfowitz it was a doctrine um in the u.s government and it exposed how the u.s plans um, full spectrum dominance and then when it was made public it was criticized so much that he rewrote it but the whole point i'm getting at is it comes all back to aggression and aggression has had survival advantages. But if we keep pursuing aggression, we are gonna end up in a world war. And I believe the way forward is a multipolar world and a world where we're not fighting over like outdated resources like oil. I mean, we spent trillions going after oil. We don't need it. We don't, we don't, we don't, we don't. We've got renewable technology. We've got technology for electric vehicles. We should have been pumping the money into this and into another industrial revolution and raising the GDP of our economy. But instead, we've gone after these resources. And after all my years of studying this, like, I still conclude that it's being done because um, it's love of power. It, it all comes back to it. It just seems to me we keep pursuing this just so a load of men can stay powerful and stay greedy. But I don't think that's how the world needs to go. I mean, essentially, we're pawns in a game. But if the oligarchs who ruled us weren't fighting over resources, and if we were working to develop renewables, to develop technology together, Humanity would be a thousand odd years ahead of where we are now. No, that. And I mean, let, let's assume there's an oligarchy, um, and um, like, which I mean, they, they must control information we are receiving because information we are exposed to creates our perception, it creates our reality, and that like. That's what we think is normal, no? Like in order to, to, um, to 
create a reality where the population um, thinks what is happening is normal. There is no conspiracy. So like, in order to, to, to create that, you need to control the media or the information we're exposed to. And could you, could you tell a little bit about um, like, how is this facilitated or like, how is this even possible? And also, like, um, um, is there something we can do about or uh, like, like you mentioned before, a couple of questions like, the, the, like whom does it serve, like the information exposed to? And um, so th this is still something which I would love to investigate a bit. Like, what can we do? Like, uh, how, how can we also what you just mentioned before? You said, don't believe me neither. But then, OK, like, hmm, OK, maybe I'm listening to this podcast and um, and maybe I'm hearing this for the first time. And then it's OK. Hmm, like, that also just claims that there is that there are facts um, supporting this um, this this theory or this conspiracy. But how how can I? I mean, we will like we will sum up the references you you just mentioned before, so that people can can read them and look into them themselves. But besides that, like maybe also you can you can pick one of uh, maybe a popular conspiracy and guide a little bit about. Um, we just spoke about the 9-11 and I mean what what I personally have witnessed or like since 9-11 uh, surveillance and control has been increased massively you know and and and, um, and that's also something which never ha has turned back since then all our communication is recorded and so if, if it's true what you're saying or if there's evidence that there are very far-fetched <laughs> Uh, consequences from these events which uh, then if it's true we must all become aware of it and do something about it uh, and, and this is this is um, incredibly complex and like yeah. difficult to grasp for someone who has never heard about it and oh absolutely I know I'm throwing a lot of information mm -hmm. at you and I, I can sympathize with people who are like their minds are going all over the place. I mean, I went through it all myself. I know, I know how it is. Uh, it is stressing. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll tackle your question first about the media. So, I mean, I can, I can go over a kind of an explanation about how the media is controlled. So originally, what well, you've got to know is the science of uh, crowd manipulation was mastered earlier in the 20th century. So Edward Bernays, he was the nephew of Sigmund Freud, and he wrote a book called Propaganda, and he explains the science of manipulating crowds psychology and getting the masses to do what people want. For example, he convinced women to smoke um, by convincing them that it was feminist and healthier than eating sweets. And Edward Bernays himself actually once said, um, yeah, we're uh, manipulated by an invisible government. Our <laughs> minds are molded by them. What we've also got to know is that the art propaganda is proven to have been mastered by, of course, the Nazi regime, who are, of course, terrible and they, you know, they brainwashed and intimidated Germany into absolute atrocities. You know, there were plenty of Germans, they, they saw themselves as heroes. Joseph Goebbels himself is on record saying, uh, give me control of the media and I'll turn any nation into a herd of pigs. Moving forward, we can see that the CIA has manipulated uh, the media. As I was talking about earlier, the University of Texas Press proved they had discrediting campaigns against conspiracy theorists. Operation Mockingbird, which um, the CIA would manipulate in the media, um, I think through the Cold War. Then moving on to that, to the present day, we've got uh, Udo Ofkot. Um, he's a best-selling author. He was a famous German journalist. I think for the Spiegel, um, he, he said, yeah, the CIA is still manipulating all of Western media. It controls narratives such as uh, the narrative in Ukraine. 
a lot of people have been saying Russia was the aggressor in Ukraine. But there are famous journalists, Western journalists, who said, no, this has been a fabrication. Christopher Booker, he's another famous journalist um, for The Telegraph. He said it as well. John Pilger, who I mentioned, Paul Craig Roberts. <laughs> so here we, we can show that the media has been manipulated for imperialistic domination of the world chessboard. So what's, how, how do we know that the media is being uh, manipulated? Well, there's further proof. So Noam Chomsky, um, one of the most side academics in the world, he wrote a book called The Art of Manufacturing Consent. And he kind of, to sum up in the book, he explains with evidence that the media, the mainstream media, is not there to put power in check. It is there to uh, deplatform people who challenge power. And he also explains how the media is a tool of the powerful. We look at the Bilderberg Group. The Bilderberg Group, the biggest media tycoons on the planet, attend. And when we know, if you believe Udo Ofcott, and if you believe Christopher Booker, you believe all the stuff about the CIA. If you look at attendees of the Bilderberg Group, a lot of them also attend what's known as the Council on Foreign Relations. The Council on Foreign Relations, the head of the CIA attends the Council on Foreign Relations. So the head of CIA is meeting up with all these media tycoons. They're clearly collaborating. And I, again, I believe the conclusion is that it's all to do with driving us into an aggressive policy that will ultimately end in disaster. So I hope, I hope that's uh, given you some stuff to go off on. But then, um, so yeah, some resources. I mean, you can turn to your, the gurus. I mean, David Icke or Alex Jones, it's, it's not for everyone what they say or how they, express things. I, I admire both of them, but I can't say I agree with everything they do, but hey, we're all different. You've got different perceptions of everything, that's fine. But for me, I found my the best resources uh, was looking at the academic work. So look at what Noam Chomsky has to say. Look at what Paul Craig Roberts has to say. Look at, I mean, you can even, <laughs> Carol Quigley, he was a professor at Georgetown University. He um, provides plenty of evidence how bankers uh, controlled society uh, in the early uh, 20th century. He's dead now, but his work's still out there. Go to John Pilger. Go to Udo Ofcott. These, re these are the most prestigious people I've ever found. And some people will argue that they're wrong, or some people will say maybe that they're Russian apologists or Chinese apologists or whatever. But when it, when it comes down to it, I mean, you've really got to make your own call. You've got to do all the research. You've got to, you've got to help teach people. It is, it is a big topic to learn. It's almost like, you know, being qualified in like a degree. I mean, that's debatable, but you you really you really got to know all this stuff. You got to be able to put it all together, and you got to be able to explain it, and you got to be able to cite it. I mean, if you believe what all these people say, the only conclusion it can be they either tell you the truth or they're propaganda agents. But there's been no proof that they're propaganda agents for a foreign government. I don't believe it. I mean, they they sh they show evidence. I mean, John Pilger, he provides evidence. For example, he interviews all these journalists across the board in his articles, such as uh, Dan Rather. And he can pull up so many journalists, for example, who say if they had done their job properly, that the Iraq war wouldn't have happened. I mean, you, you really do have to study. You can't just read a Washington Post article, you can't read the Telegraph or the Times, and you can't be there and delude yourself that you're well informed. 
you want the information, you go straight to the source, you get rid of the Chinese whispers, you look at it, and then you meditate on it, and you look in your heart of hearts. As I said, you've got to want to accept the truth. You've got to have the mentality is like, I want, um, I don't want like a world war. I know humanity can improve. You gotta look at it like, I want the truth. You gotta be honest with yourself. You gotta look at all your biases. Like you can't think like, oh, but I, like, I fought in Iraq or whatever, like all my friends fought in Iraq. And it is, it's a very sensitive topic and it can be very emotional for some people. And some people find it easier to accept and you've really got to find a way to leave your ego behind in some cases so you can embrace this information and that can be a very hard thing to do but i mean you just if you really want to you've got to try and it is a journey and it can drive you crazy it can really annoy you but as i said i've been going through this for nine years i mean i've had days when i just didn't want to get out of bed i just felt so bad about it all but deep down yeah, deep down, though, I know humanity, we've got the technology for a better world. And at the end of the day, you just got to focus on that. I believe the choice, it comes down to war and power, or peace and love. Yeah, that's a, that's a very nice message. And I um, would, would be curious to hear a bit more about your journey and how, I mean, in a sense, you change the complete worldview, right? And with that... Yeah probably also came along that not everybody agrees with your new world worldview and that maybe the people you related to or surrounding you they kind of um not followed your your way and you met new people and like that just personally must have been quite a bit of a, a difficult period also given that i mean in the 20s it's 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 very early right to to um, maybe question yeah 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 it is world, don't you yeah, like, to be honest, I, I went quite a long time without <laughs> even uh, hooking up with girls because um, I'd describe myself as a bit of a safe, it's called a sapiosexual. It's when you need, like, a bit of um, a connection mentally to be attracted. And because it, it really felt like, you know, I was from, like, Mars and, like, other people were just from, like, you know venus or whatever <laughs> we felt like two completely different worlds and i found it really hard like um a lot of my friends immediately they call me a joke they tell me to shut up i remember my own granddad one time he sat me down he's like just, please just stop so i just stop it's like we don't want it he's like you've got to just stop it it's just embarrassing but i well, i just always i believed that. it yeah and, I mean, my, my family didn't believe me. As I said, you know, I was just a 20 year old. I, I was a no one, like, you know, and I didn't have any qualifications, you know. I, what was I doing before that? You know, I was just going out drinking, you know, just joking around. I, I was an absolute no one. Who, who was going to take me seriously? I soon, I soon figured out that the only way anyone would take me seriously is if I found evidence that they couldn't argue with. And that's one of the reasons I go off on all these tangents because I've got all this evidence floating around in my head all the time um yeah like and how's people, the, how's the relationship how's the relationship now with your family or you you said your granddad like you were with the evidence that like did you convince them now or is it uh, more that uh, I, I don't know if i can convince them 100 percent. i think it's one of those things so even if i had convinced them i don't think they would ever admit it <laughs> because <laughs> but you know you know some people can just be like a bit egotistical or they i think they believe like a lot of it but yeah um i mean it did start off i mean they thought maybe something was wrong with me like why are you just worried about this like why aren't you trying to enjoy your life so many people were saying this to me like why aren't you out there you know um like trying to sleep with as many women as possible why don't you just want to watch the football or they're like this is just nonsense and then the thing is like people who do start to believe what you have to say like so even i could i had like some friends they believe 9-11 was an inside job right at the time i convinced them 
but they thought, okay, 9-11's an inside job. I don't want to get involved with this shit. I'm just going to tell him to shut up, even though I know it's an inside job. They just think, whatever's going on, like, you know, I'm comfortable in life. You know, Western society, you know, we make a lot of money. I, I don't want things to change. So people, even when they believe you, they just want to sweep you under the rug. Because, you know, you, you threaten people's whole existence and the, their whole way of life. But it, and it, that's a very hard thing to overcome. I mean, for years, like, um, I can give you another example. I mean, I've been accusing the royal family of being involved in child trafficking for at least, I think, eight years now. And in England, the royal family, you know, everyone loves them. The, the media are constantly shoving them down your throat. And when I'm going around saying, no, they're involved in child trafficking, I mean, people immediately just reject you because, you know, in England, it's patriotism. It's drilled into your head. We love the Queen. We want what's best for the country, like Queen and country, Queen and country. We do what's best for the royal family. You know, the royal family, they control the military. They're in charge of the courts. Um, so, yeah, it's a really big deal in England to say such things about the royal family. And... You know, I got rejected for saying things about this, you know. I didn't get invited to as many parties. People didn't want to hang around with me. People would just look at me. People would be scared of me, like, because mm -hmm. I, I was such a mystery that, because people don't know all this stuff that I've just explained to you. I mean, people don't know it. And, and I'd say you're more enlightened than most people about what is potentially going on in the world. You've got to realise that a lot of people... When you just try and throw them straight into this new reality, they immediately reject it. They can't take it. They, so they just look at you and they think, he's crazy. What is he? He's scary or whatever. And, you know, I'm just here. I'm, I'm trying to put out all this evidence. But people, you know, I'm, I'm an enigma in some people's minds. But as I said, all I really want to do, as I said, I am convinced that we will end up in a world war. And my ultimate goal is to help try and stop this world war and evolve society using the new technology that we have uh, is suppressed from us. So yeah, so ultimately I've just, I mean, I wasn't ostracized by everyone, but I've, I've been on a journey when I've definitely been ostracized and I've just had to have thick skin really. I've, I ended up being happy in my own company I kind of just turned to researching and, you know, I, I just went to the gym a lot. I ended up just doing a load of solo activities. Um, but yeah, you know, it, I just, I just had to, I just had to overcome it. I mean, it's just one of those things, but I'm, I am meeting a lot more like-minded people these days, which I'm very happy about. <laughs> Yeah, you, you've got to, you've got to be um, you've got to really believe in the cause to put your neck out there. That's another thing. People see me getting ostracised. People are like, I don't want to be ostracised. Like, or well, I don't want this beautiful girl to think I'm crazy. I'm not going to say this stuff. I'm going to go on Facebook and say 9/11 was an inside job. This is how people think. So some people they'll reject it, or some people they'll just say, all right, I'll do what I can for the cause. Like they won't admit it's all true but maybe behind they'll just be like oh Edward Amos he's he's a good guy maybe some of my friends are like he's a good guy but he's wrong about everything like um yeah it's very complicated how people everyone's different everyone's reaction to the information is different some people can't accept it some people accept it and don't want anything to do with it some people will help you out they won't put their neck out for you and of course like I've had trouble with like employers that I've had, like, um, you know, I'm just saying all this stuff um, and it freaks out a lot of people, the companies I've worked at. And I haven't exactly been fired from anywhere, but I've kind of been, I've been forced out of a few companies. And all I can say is, you know, like I work hard, you know, I didn't make any big mistakes. And when, you know, those aren't on the board, the only reasons left for them to force you out is because, they find your presence like annoying or they find it disturbing or controversial. How, how does, how does the, the, the look exactly? So it's, um, you are with 
whatever a crew of people and then if something comes up a topic or a theme then you're just going after it and you're telling the truth or what you know about it or is it is it uh, like how can i imagine it because um from own experience but then of course not like just knowing something it doesn't mean that you, you kind of stand up for it or that you're kind of like uh, i mean like, personal experience right now with COVID, no, like in the lockdown measures, there's, there's a lot of um, things you really question, but, but then one thing is to know it, the other one is to, to do something publicly about it. And like, like uh, how, how did you, was that ever something you, you uh, questioned? Like, okay, now I know this and well, can I share this? Should I share this? Or, or was it just, well, like now that I know it, I have to share it with whoever I'm exposed to. I've got to be honest, like, because what happened to me, like, I didn't start off preaching as, I would say like I'm an a expert in this field now. I didn't start off as an expert, you know, so when I started off preaching, you know, I was talking a lot of nonsense about it mm -hmm. that didn't add up, which would uh, confuse people. But I've always just had it in my head, like, I've got to keep preaching this because ultimately I believe if I need to do my part, because I'm convinced that we will end up in a world war. So I was like, okay, I can't wait tomorrow. The time to strike is now in the present with all of this stuff because you know, time is off the essence, I believe. Um, so I can give you an example of how it was. So, <laughs> so if they're a group of people, I mean, there's, there'll be a big debate where Prince Andrew is guilty of uh, raping this trafficked victim. I'm going to say that uh, I believe he is guilty. Epstein's mentor, Stephen Hoffenberg, said he's guilty. And like all the stuff he says, it doesn't really add up. Palace security question his whole story. I mean, the records of him not being... Um, sorry, the, the security records are very anal for the royal family and they've all disappeared. It's just the whole thing. So I'm going to say right off the bat that I've always believed that the royal family were involved with child trafficking. And so when people used to talk about how much they loved the royal family, they used to be talking about Kate uh, Middleton or whatever. So one time I'll go to a specific moment. I was out in a club and like I was talking to this girl. I don't know how old I was, maybe like 20, 21. And... Um, She's talking about the royal family and immediately say, you know what? I hate the royal family. It's like, I think we should get rid of them. I'm like, I do not appreciate what they've been doing. And immediately, like, I'd get a load of dirty looks like that. It's like, what have you just said? And like, you know, they'd be like, I don't want anything to do with this guy. And they'd just walk off. And... <laughs> It is, it's a funny thing, like, you, you do close a lot of doors because you got to remember that um, I've been in the mi minority for a long time, a very small minority, and when you step out of mainstream culture and when you criticise it that much, it's not like just when you criticise someone's beliefs, it's like you're criticising them and they want to reject you because you're disrespecting their ego. Not intentionally. They take it like you're disrespecting their ego and you're... It, I mean, you're disrespecting their whole reality. And, you know, people don't want that around. It's, if I went up to a religious person and I started criticizing all their religious beliefs, it, it's the same concept, really. Mm. Yeah, that, that's um, something I also have learned that beliefs, if you, if you attack someone's beliefs, the same reach in the brain are triggered as a lion is standing in front of you. <laughs> it's, it's, it's literally survival. And uh, um, yeah, just, I'm just imagining how it was 10 years ago. Right now, conspiracy th theories became a bit more popular. There are lots of people involved in it. There's also this QAnon movement yeah, yeah. or whatever it is. Like, what's your take on this? Or maybe you can, you can explain for those who don't know it what this is about. So QAnon... Um, QAnon is this group of uh, people in America, they've become world right, uh, sorry, worldwide now. So about, um, they say half of Republicans actually believe that QAnon is either completely true or partly true. 
So interestingly, now I'm becoming like the majority. Mm -hmm. I don't think the QAnon conspiracy is 100% true, but essentially the QAnon conspiracy is Donald Trump is fighting um, a satanic cult of elite pedophiles. And this is the thing with uh, conspiracies. That, all right, people call these guys satanic, the oligarchy. And what we got to know is the oligarchy are involved in child trafficking. So when people start saying they're satanic, you don't have to think they're literally, you know, like worshipping Satan. But it's almost like you might as well be satanic because, you know, you're, you're being so evil and you're like trafficking children that you might as well be satanic. I mean, I can't say for sure if Donald Trump is trying to take these lot down. Um, I kind of see Donald Trump as a wild card. I think he's not in line with the oligarchy as they would want him to be. I kind of think because he's so powerful, he'll kind of do what he wants more. So in a way, like, this is why I support Trump more, because I think he's more out of the sphere of control of the oligarchy. But what I can say for the QAnon conspiracy is 100% the elite are involved in child trafficking, and they have been since at least the 1980s. I mean, there, there's a documentary um, by the aide to the director of the CIA, John DeCamp, and William Colby, who's the director of the CIA, he says this documentary is all true. It's called Conspiracy of Silence, and he exposes how all the elite, they were um, taking boys, little boys from, uh, I think, I, th I can't remember what it's called. I think Jonestown. Um, anyway, don't quote me on that. But it, it, they were taking boys and they were trafficking them to powerful senators and the elite. And of course, you look at Jeffrey Epstein and you realize that, yeah, the elite are involved in child trafficking. So what I believe is the QAnon conspiracy is partly true. I believe, well, there certainly are elite child tra trafficking rings. Um, and they were covered up. I mean, look how Epstein, Epstein got a sweetheart deal. We need to remember his sweetheart deal. He was caught, um, you know, you involved in all these um, involved in all these child trafficking rings and he got a slap on the wrist and minimal prison time i think he was even allowed out of prison i think he had conditions he was allowed to travel outside of his prison and do stuff and then come back to prison and he got off with soliciting uh, soliciting sorry sex from a minor um which is a much more minor offense than being involved in child trafficking but what I'm saying is this proves that the elite were helping him. He had help. Epstein had help from the courts. He had help from the governments. He had help from powerful people. And then, of course, we could go into Epstein's murder. And if you believe he was murdered, you need to conclude that the elite were involved because only they would have the power to cover it up. And, I mean, I could do a whole episode on this. But what I will say about Epstein is that his brother believes he was murdered. Uh, I mean, he was six foot, he hung himself from a bed that was smaller than him. And all the guards, you know, they conveniently weren't on duty. The video camera footage went missing. And yeah, Epstein even said someone tried to murder him um, and he survived it in prison before. So, I mean, there's a lot of stuff you need to look into but we need to know that the elite are 100 involved in child trafficking and it is it's disgusting it really is i mean i could rant about this for hours and hours but i'll just sum it up so we see prince andrew you know he's big dog really powerful you know really high in the military really famous he's got a load of people brainwashed convincing him that he's you know a fairy tale prince and he still, and he still goes for the sex trafficked victim. It's disgusting. I mean, it's bad enough to go for a sex trafficked victim anyway, but he's got all of this game that he can use. I mean, he could divorce, he could see 50 prostitutes or whatever, and he still goes for the sex trafficked victim. And for me, it's just one of the most evil things you can do. So I, I, did that answer your question? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, what, like, what I'm witnessing here that they're um, like, 
there were there was manifestations in, in in Germany against lockdown measures, and you've seen a lot of Q anon flags. So it's it's even here in Switzerland that in Germany, uh, you can see that that people are buying into this or um, like following it, um, and the bit I'm aware of is that there is a big plan and correct me if I'm wrong, that everything is laid out, that uh, like if Trump is following the process to um, clean the world from this oligarchy or this, this uh, child trafficking ring. And um, which if you buy into this narrative, it sounds quite amazing. And um, there's a lot of, material like information shared you know, which supports this this um this perspective but then on the other hand i'm also asking like like if like if the narrative is it's all laid out yeah like we're executing the plan it also means that hey i can lay back yeah and that's maybe exactly like i don't have to do something myself yeah I, I, like everything is planned everything is like the problems are getting solved. And so I can just lean back and wait and watch the movie. <laughs> it feels like a little bit like, uh, and then, and then maybe, maybe then indirectly you're doing the same as everybody else. <laughs> yeah. Just leaning back and not doing anything about whatever interest is, is there in the world. And um, what are your thoughts about this? Sir? I think that, you need to put your trust in yourself the most. I mean, okay, you can see this stuff and you can say, okay, Donald Trump, he's not, you know, doing what the oligarchy um, wants all the time, but you can't put all your trust in anyone. Why risk it? I mean, okay, Donald Trump, he could change. You don't know, he could turn on a dime suddenly. I mean, I would, I'd like to believe in Donald Trump, but I, I've got to be honest, I don't think it's a good idea to put all your faith in someone. I certainly don't think it's a good time to sit back and do nothing. I mean, is Donald Trump doing things that the oligarchy don't want? Well, yes, it, it seems he is, especially if you observe his actions in Syria. It does seem that, you know, he's, he's not... Um, always dance into their tune and this is promising but it doesn't mean we shouldn't continue to keep an eye on Donald Tr Trump what he does is to uh, continue to be scrutinized and you've got to remember a lot of people hate Donald Trump and we, we still got to reach out with our knowledge and information to people I, I, I think definitely don't stop don't just sit back and watch what happens after all life isn't a movie life is here to be lived and i think everyone is your responsibility to carry on just asking all the questions um you know we just keep just keep teaching keep uh, researching keep trying to find a better way just just don't let you know, just don't um, relax. That's what I'd say. And uh, this is something you have dedicated yourself to. I know that you launched your own podcast called Conspiracy Real. So this is, I assume, about reaching more people with those information. Yes, yes, it is. Yes, uh, I can talk a little bit about Conspiracy Reel now, I guess. Yeah, basically Conspiracy Reels podcast with me. And the goal is to have guests on and we're going to tackle in each uh, episode a particular theory. So, for example, maybe I'll do an episode on 9-11. I'll do an episode on global warming. I'll do an episode on flat earth. And the aim of Conspiracy Reel is to kind of... Um, get back to this, I always call it a science, a science of uh, separating conspiracy facts from theory, from nonsense. And um, so people can really take reign of reality. And so they can learn how to decipher and um, 
learn how to teach people as well about conspiracy topics. For example, there's a lot of controversy over global warming. Personally, I believe in global warming. Uh, I think if we can prove global warming is real and not a conspiracy theory, that's something that needs to be done. So yeah, yeah you think conspiracy it is? I don't Sorry? know. It sounds super, super, uh, super, super interested and interesting and really curious. Um, yeah, maybe I can have you on. <laughs> oh, that would be fun. And, and you just made me curious about global warming. Do you like that's another conspiracy, or like people believe it's not the case? Some people, like, while the, the like, how, how, like, if you give a, you could give a, a quick uh, summary of the situation there. All right, sure. So, global warming, you can fall into three camps. You can either believe global warming is just nonsense, it's a conspiracy by the elite to control us, um, maybe through their carbon permits, for example. You can believe it's just exaggerated purposefully, and there is truth into it, and it's exaggerated for some ulterior agenda. Or you can just believe it's true, and maybe you can say, okay, it was exaggerated, but it was exaggerated because they want people to act now. They don't want people to act in 10 years' time. They want people to act now. Personally, I believe in it. I'm not saying that I'm 100% sure, but all I say is, I mean, you observe the planet Venus and, you know, polluting the atmosphere in Venus is the reason why Venus has the hottest surface temperature out of all the planets in the solar system. Um, also, I have read this book called Merchants of Doubt, and it kind of does prove that scientists have been paid off to say that global warming is nonsense. And generally, like the vast majority of uh, scientists who are expert in, in climatology say that global warming is real. Um, but yeah, we could get into a big debate about this. I mean, that there are some very... Um, prominent conspiracy researchers who say it is um, a, a conspiracy. I think David Icke says it's a conspiracy. And hey, you know, as I said, I don't always agree with David Icke, but he has said some fantastic things. Um, I do respect his courage. But at the end of the day, you've got to remember, I mean, we're all human. I mean, some people have more logical minds than others. Um, or some and uh, or some people just know more about certain topics than others so you, you kind of just got um you, you've got to be patient with people because there are a lot of people out there they'll say global warming is uh a conspiracy and you know that they're being genuine they believe it but hey you never know maybe i'm wrong but i've got to say i've, I've never seen anything that's really convinced me it is a conspiracy but the debate will remain open. Um, yeah, Ed, maybe we can leave that uh, for, for a second episode. I think uh, from, from what you mentioned today, there's so much more to be explored and uh, it's been amazing to have you here and to share uh, like, yeah, your knowledge with all of us. Is there, is there something else you want to share with people listening or watching this? My last words are just, you know, if, if you want truth, just go to your gurus, search it for yourself. And just, if you want truth, you gotta want it. And just remember there are always better ways and humans are amazing creatures. Look at what we've accomplished. We put a, a man on the moon, we've got into space, nuclear energy. We've got so much potential humanity and just, just don't underestimate yourself and others and because the truth can set you free and I believe we need the truth. That's it. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, I buy into this. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. It's been a pleasure.